This was ineffective against an enemy who, sheltered and alert in the bush, fought with an advantage. Vela was convinced that with the death of the Cuban leader Antonio Maffeo in December of 1896, the revolution would come to an end. Canovas, the president of the Spanish government, had once commented that the problem in Cuba could be solved with two well-aimed bullets, implying the possibility of Maximo Gomez and Maceo's death in the fighting. Destiny, however, decided that Canovas himself would die of a bullet shot by an anarchist in August 1897. The situation in Cuba worsened because the Spanish army was left with limited resources and was only able to defend cities, villages, and military lines. Out in the field, the unquestionable leader was the Cuban army. Meanwhile, the Spanish government replaced Baylor with General Blanco as commander in charge of the island. General Blanco was a mason. He was possibly sent to the island of Cuba to negotiate in secret with the Cuban rebels. For the Spanish cabinet of Sagasta, 1898 started out very well indeed. Cuba and Puerto Rico were governing themselves. And there was peace in the Philippines after the Biak Nabatoc Treaty between General Primo de Rivera and the Tagalog leader Aguinaldo, Rizal's successor. Although confident of a victory in case of conflict, Spaniards had other things on their minds. The bullfighting season, the celebration of Carnival, and the season's new theater productions. On January 25th, the government of the United States sent the battleship Maine on a friendly visit to the port of La Habana. In response, the Spanish government sent the cruiser Vizcaya to the port of New York. This is surely the only film stock available of the cruiser Vizcaya, and possibly the first shot of a 19th century Spanish warship. On the night of February 15th, a tremendous explosion destroyed the main, killing 266 American crew members. International tensions increased after the incident, and the already difficult relations with the United States worsened. The unfortunate explosion of the main was used as an excuse to declare war. The Americans would not permit a joint commission to investigate the cause of the explosion. Although the Americans claimed it was caused outside the hull, possibly by a submarine mine, the Spaniards said they had not seen dead fish in the bay and insisted the explosion occurred inside the ship, possibly due to the boiler or by the spontaneous combustion of gun cotton with which they loaded the torpedoes. Thirteen years later, in 1911, the remainder of the hull was re-examined on dry land and an American commission ratified their conclusion, though with some variations. Immediately afterwards, they decided to sink the remains of the ship in the open sea and to close the investigation. It would be many years later when the father of the American atomic submarine, Admiral Rickover, would declare that the explosion on the main could have been caused by an internal and spontaneous combustion of the coal cellars, discarding the idea of sabotage and criticizing the superficiality of the U.S. Investigation Committee. The explosion of the main, together with American sympathy for the Cuban cause, certain sectors' annexionist ambitions towards Spanish possessions, and the government in Washington's conviction that Spain could not win against the revolution in Cuba, made war inevitable. The United States made one last attempt, carried out in secret between President McKinley and the regent Queen Maria Cristina, to satisfy their interests with minimum risk, the purchase of Cuba from Spain for $300 million. Meanwhile, in the United States, public opinion and the press intensified the pressure. Pulitzer and Hearst, two of the news magnets of American yellow press, used all the news associated with the war in Cuba to increase their number of readers. 
first increased his circulation to one and a half million, often by questionable means, reporting on isolated incidents in Cuba. The Spanish press dismissed the importance of the potential enemy and exaggerated Spain's own military glories and the magnitude of the warships and arms being sent, when in fact they were sending deficient and unfinished ships to Cuba. Pablo Iglesias, founder of the Spanish Socialist Workers' Party, wrote at the time, It's not enough to blame the Yankees for the grave situation in which we find ourselves. The people at fault for what is happening to us today are at home. They are from our own country. There is no doubt that those responsible for the war we find ourselves in are mostly all our own politicians, irregardless of their ideologies. With the prospect of war against the United States, on the 8th of April, the Spanish government ordered the commander of the instruction fleet, Admiral Ferreira, to sail towards the Americas without clear orders and in precarious conditions. Even the government believed that only the intervention of Pope Leo XIII or the largest European powers could prevent the worst. On April 11th, the Senate and House of Representatives of the United States agreed in a joint session to demand that Spain cease all activity in Cuba and withdraw its land and naval forces from the island, stating that the United States had no intention or desire to intervene in Cuba except to ensure peace. On the 21st of April, the United States declared war against Spain, and the following day, President McKinley gave the order to blockade the Cuban ports, calling for 125,000 volunteers to join the armed forces. Evidently, the government of the United States had prepared well in advance and understood that the essential issue in this war would be supremacy at sea. With this in mind, they sent three squadrons to the Spanish island colonies. Admiral Sampson's and Commodore Schley's were to head towards Cuba and block the principal Cuban ports. While Commodore Dewey's, which was anchored in Hong Kong, was to leave for the Philippines. From San Vicente at Cape Verde, the meeting point of the Spanish naval forces, Admiral Cervera had repeatedly expressed to the Secretary of the Navy the importance of protecting the Spanish coast and the Canary Islands before heading towards the Americas, where disaster would be practically inevitable. On the 24th of April, however, he received notice that a special meeting was held in Madrid in which 19 admirals decided the strategy to follow. The majority made the decision to continue towards the Antilles. He was also advised the American flag would be considered to be that of the enemy. Because of the difference of opinions, Cervera suggested the possibility of replacing him, but no one dared to do so. On the 29th of April, he started off on a difficult journey towards Martinique. From there, he set course for Curaçao, pretending to go for coal. But when he realized he would get neither the coal nor the logistic support promised in Madrid, he decided finally to head towards Santiago de Cuba. Meanwhile, far away in the Philippines, the first part of the disaster took place.